All right. Hey, hey, everyone. This week, we're talking about René Descartes' meditation on first philosophy. So this is where he sets out the whole, I think, therefore I am thing, which is pretty famous. Uh, now, a few things to say before then. You can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. If you want to see pictures of my cats, mostly, uh, you can also find this in podcast form pretty much wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, as well, you can find me on Patreon if anyone is willing to contribute. That would be great. I should give a shout out to Boz, Henrik, probably Henrik, James, John, Ye Juiced or Used, Killswitch, Matt, Nicholas, Sebastian, and Ashley, who have all been extremely helpful in keeping this going, at least keeping it going every week as I've been doing. Uh, and other than that, everyone, of course, in these times, make sure to stay safe. Now, without wasting any more of your time with that, Let's jump into this text. So this titled Meditations on First Philosophy is broken into six meditations. So we're going to go through each of them one by one. So instead of it being like chapters, it's six uh, meditations. And it's a pretty short text, so it should be fairly quick. Ah, maybe not, actually. But anyways, let's start with Meditation 1, titled Concerning Those Things That Can Be Called Into Doubt. Now, he starts out this by kind of setting the tone, the timber where he leaves, you know, wherever he is, to go live in isolation or solitude, almost to begin what he calls the demolition of his opinions. Now, he wants to do this because he wants to, in some sense, remove himself from the world, which I will say kind of, you know, add the caveat, like, of course, you can never do that, but he wants to exist in as much isolation as possible. Now, he wants to do this because he wants to carefully interrogate op opinions that he knows to be overtly false and those to have some kind of semblance of truth. Now, he does this not by running through each opinion in his mind, like, you know, the opinion that God is good or the opinion that, you know, earth or, or the world is present or the world is real. Instead, what he does is he tries to get at the very foundations about what you know, opinions are. And by virtue of that, he can get at the core, at least in his mind, of undoing those opinions by taking down the uh, the base upon which they reside, notably things like thought and you know, thinking. So he begins by thinking about the senses, thinking about things that come to us via the senses as well. So he, he thinks, he says that these things kind of appear to be the most true, because we can kind of all agree on them. If I was among other people in this room right now, we would all agree that there's, you know, a computer here and a microphone and a lamp and whatever. We all have these kinds of sensations, these uh, interactions with the world that give us the semblance of them being true. Now, Descartes says, hey, we should be a little bit careful here because we cannot be sure that these things are not false. These things are not just part of a collective illusion. And the reason that he says that is because, and he says, the reason I know this to be a possible illusion is because I sleep at night. And when I sleep, I dream. And in those dreams, even though dreams are not real, things appear as though they're real. Where, and we've all, I'm sure, had these experiences where we have these vivid dreams that appear so real that when you wake up, you're kind of in a, you're confused, right? Because you, you thought you were in the real world. So he uses that as an example to problematize our kind of uh, immediate assumption that the external world and how it is mediated through our senses is a real phenomenon. But we, you know, he runs up into a little bit of a problem here because he recognizes that these things must have some kind of reality. Like they must exist to some extent because we are perceiving them. And this is something he'll develop more fully toward the end, uh, especially I think in the last meditation. But he just kind of reduces all of these things to a corpor corporeal nature, which is, I guess, to draw another equ an equivalent with Kant. Now, Kant was extremely, you know, kind of skeptical of, of Descartes, with skeptical being, you know, I'm using that term kind of loosely here. Uh, he was skeptical of Descartes for thinking that Descartes could just remove himself and then purely think the world as though that's possible. Uh, but... One of the parallels we can draw is the one that uh, Kant, I guess, sketches between what he calls the noumenon, which is the thing in itself, 
the thing that exists in the world prior to perception, but then there's also the phenomenon. And the phenomenon is the thing in the world that we see, we touch, we smell, we hear, but that, you know, doesn't, at least as far as we know, doesn't necessarily correspond to the noumenon. It's just the way that it is presented to humans, how humans understand it or how subjects understand it. So Descartes recognizes that there is this noumenon, perhaps, this kind of realness of the thing, but we don't know that for sure because we only ever get these kinds of like images of it. So he draws an interesting contrast here between two broad camps. And on one, in one camp, on one side, you have physics, astronomy, and medicine, which he contrasts to uh, arithmetic geom and geometry. Now, he says that we would find that the former, that is physics, uh, astronomy, and medicine, might be led astray in its search for truth because of its belief in what he calls composite things. Whereas the latter, that is arithmetic and geometry, uh, might be more difficult to disprove because these things rely upon uh, or they demand whether these things do or do not in fact exist. So there's in arithmetic and geometry, there is a commitment to things that aren't necessarily real. And he'll come to develop this a little further. For example, like a triangle doesn't exist in nature, yet when we think of a triangle, we all have the same kind of idea about it as though it was kind of imminent to what humans are, like as though we have some faculties for comprehending triangles as though they were real. So there's a kind of like truthfulness to that in that it almost transcends the possible um, illusion of the world and of our senses. And so he gives another example. He's like, in a dream, two plus three still equals five. So there's this consistency when we use these this idea of like pure mathematics that he'll come to call it, or, the, or any kind of abstract ideas that seem to resonate with everyone. So having kind of set this tone here, he concludes this meditation by asking, okay, if I exist um, in a world that is illusory, that is in a world that is comprised of illusions, then to whom do I owe the credit of this? magnificent deception and he says that it can't really be god because if god exists it, it god contains some axiomatic uh, principles or kind of apodictic certainties that cannot be um that cannot be denied one that god is good and so descartes says if god is good then god is not a deceiver and therefore i can't say god is deceiving me so he says instead, we might be able to credit it to this thing called, you know, the evil genius, the evil demon. And then he concludes this meditation by saying that he's going to go ahead and start to doubt everything, even his, corpo his corporeal body, you know, even his hands, his legs, his, his face, it, every part of him, he's going to doubt whether or not these things exist, whether or not they have an essence that is not just pure illusion, a kind of like simulation, to use a term, perhaps a anachronistic term here. So that propels us here into the second meditation titled concerning the nature of the human mind that it is better known than the body. So now having ostensibly doubted everything, you know, even those things we take to be the most true, like our bodies, for instance, these things that give us a connection to the world that might be deceptive, we could at least maybe at some point say, at least my body is real because it's perceiving these things. Having done away with all of these things, at least ostensibly, he accepts that maybe there is no kind of truth, that these things in the world don't exist, and then therefore, what does exist? What What is the, the thing that lasts in the universe, in, you know, in, in the world? But something interesting happens at this moment, the moment where he has doubted everything. He finds that he is still thinking. He is still in the process of undoing those prejudices. And the one thing that he cannot get away from is thought itself. Because to undo thought implies thought, right? To doubt thought, you need to mobilize thought. So thought seems to be the thing that lasts, even once you have doubted everything. And here enters that phrase, I think, therefore I am. Thinking is what underwrites all our perceptions of anything else. So here it takes on another form, I guess, in, in his words. He says, I am, I exist, 
is necessarily true every time I utter it or conceive it in my mind. But it should be apparent that this I, this this I, this I thing in the world, like when you think about who you are, Descartes says it isn't your body, it isn't your soul, it is an action, it is you thinking. You are the action of thinking. And the thinking thing for him, that is we are the thinking animal, no, not like Aristotle that suggests we are the political animal, or other people like the social animal or whatever, we are the thinking thing for Descartes. And this is a thing in his words that doubts, understands, affirms, denies, uh, wills, refuses, and also imagines and senses. Now, having discovered this, he presents an irony. And the irony is that we seem to have more knowledge about the external world, you know, the, its properties, its, its conditions, characteristics, than we do then about ourselves, about the thing that underwrites our perceptions of the external world which for him he's, he says that's quite tragic and he's what he's doing here at least in this project is kind of trying to find this so-called truth of human kind of consciousness so that you know a new science can emerge from that having found this new bedrock that can be you know uh, experimented on can be studied can be can be learned but this doesn't this wouldn't be an easy task and he gives the example of a piece of wax and how difficult it is to kind of locate an identity or to ground a kind of truthful identity of a piece of wax. Now, he's talking about a hardened piece of wax here at first. So essentially to illustrate this, he describes a piece of wax in his fingers, which is characterized by its hardness, coldness, hollowness, because, you, you know, you can knock on it and it'll be hollow to some extent. So as he moves this piece of wax towards a a flame, for instance, it starts to melt and all these characteristics change, yet it still retains the identity of wax. It's, it is still wax, even though its characteristics have altered. So having now seen that the properties of wax, its characteristics can change without its identity necessarily changing, Descartes says that maybe the only thing true about the wax is its flexibility and its mutability but that doesn't actually tell us anything about the wax specifically because it seems like everything could then fall under that kind of rubric can can correspond to these criteria if something is flexible and mutable then it, it attains its identity but if everything can do that then what are the lasting characteristics of anything However, what we are most certain about when it comes to this wax is that we cannot perceive it thus without a human mind. So once we have, you know, tried to search in the wax or among the, you know, the residual wax particles that are, remain after it approaches the fire, what we come to find is that we are looking less at the wax than we are looking at the very operations that make um, our perception of the wax possible. That is the, the mind that is seeing the wax because we can't be sure of the wax even being there, let alone finding some, um, you know, unchanging immutable characteristics of that wax because we already know it changes and develops. So again, we kind of come back to the mind here and that propels us into the third meditation titled Concerning God that He Exists. So now he turns his attention, as the title suggests, to God, perhaps the thing that creates all these illusions or has, creates our thinking capacity. And he says that if I am ignorant of this, that is God, it appears I am incapable of being completely certain about anything else. Now before then, or before this, uh, before he goes into it, I should say, he divides his um, thoughts, I guess, or his kind of um, cognitive faculties into two broad camps, where he says that there are volitions or affects, and then there are judgments. So volitions and affects, he says, can't really be wrong, for although I can choose evil things, or uh, evil things that are utterly non-existent, or sorry, I, I misquoted there, uh, for although I can choose evil things, or even things that are utterly non-existent, I cannot conclude from this that it is untrue that I do choose these things, 
So while the decisions I might make or the perceptions of a thing uh, might not be correct, they might be, you know, the wrong perception of the thing because the thing might have deceived me or, you know, I might have deceived myself by some previous prejudice or whatever. I cannot deny the fact that this perception is happening. So it does seem true. Now, in terms of judgments, they can be wrong when they claim to produce apodictic, apodictic sorry, concordance with certain things outside of me. That is, I have a having a judgment that is supposed to correspond to a thing, let's say that the, the wax is hard. That is what uh, one of the immutable characteristics of wax. But I soon come to find that if I move this wax toward fire, it melts. It is still wax. Now I've shown that my judgment was incorrect. That is the idea I had in my mind no longer corresponded to a so-called truth of a thing outside of me. So he takes the time now to think a little bit more about judgment, that is those ideas we have about the world, which come primarily from our kind of experiencing the world, that is our existing in a world in which our senses kind of uh, change that, you know, manifold data into, or the images into data that our brains can then comprehend, right, which we then turn into judgments. So if we approach a fire, we feel warmth. But then it is our judgment, that is our mind, our intellect, that associates that warmth with fire. Because it would, wouldn't seem as though uh, just having sense uh, understanding of the thing would be enough for us to draw the conclusion that fire equals heat. Because if it just came down to our senses, then, you know, we're, we're taking in a lot of sense data at any one time. We wouldn't necessarily have the capacity to kind of nail down where this heat is emanating from. For all I know, it could just be an interaction that is happening between, you know, this particular substance, fire, coming in contact with air at a certain time of day with a, it, within a certain temperature that happens to produce an effect. And fire will not actually produce that same effect or cause uh, in different settings or it won't cause those different effects in other settings, right? So it is our judgment that fills in those blanks that draws these conclusions. So we have these judgments, and these judgments kind of create the mental image of the thing, where we think of heat and we, we connect it with the idea of fire. What is happening in our mind is a kind of series of operations of, I guess, depicting, illustrating this process. We draw connections and whatnot. Now, from whence do these images come? Well, the first step would be to recognize that they come from the exterior world and that our senses recognize them, right? But then where does that image come from? And where does the image of that image come from? Where do all these causes come from? So if the image in my mind is seen as an effect, an effect of a certain stimulation that our senses um I guess, mediated to us, that is the heat from the fire, which the conclusion is that we associate heat with fire in our minds. Descartes asks, if this is really a situation of cause and effect, then we could ostensibly follow these causes all the way back to an original source. So this is what he says. And although one idea can perhaps issue from another, nevertheless, no infinite regress is permitted here Eventually, some first idea must be reached whose cause is a sort of archetype that contains formally all the reality that is in the idea merely objectively. So if the world is an illusion, that illusion must be the representation of something or of something's will, i.e. God, of God's will. It doesn't just exist without anything behind it. So this is kind of like Plato's cave here where those people in the cave are seeing these images on the wall. But we know that these images are just a representation of a real thing. And the whole process is undoing our association with these images as being the truth, and instead looking at what underwrites them, which is like what, what Descartes is setting out to do here. So here we're getting, you know, the possibility of God's existence being this kind of original thing from which these illusions might emanate or the things in the world might derive from. But Descartes also says that we can't be fully certain 
that these illusions of the world, these images, have not been created by me in a kind of dream state, right? They're just my mind running amok. Now, he says something interesting that we can only really be sure of what he calls substance and duration. So this is in Kant, this is echoed in his ideas about in the transcendental aesthetic when he talks about how space and time seem to always exist. They're kind of like the universal media through which anything is perceptible at all. Perceptible? Perceivable? Recognizable? Sorry. Anything is perceivable at all. We need space and time. So he's recognizing that here as well, where we can't think of anything that doesn't take up space nor that doesn't exist in time. So we see ourselves as finite substance. That is, we have, uh, we are extended bodies. That is, we are bodies that extend into space, yet that space has a, a, a limit, right? We only take up so much space. Now, we know that. We don't know the kind of truth of the thing, but we do know that it does take up some space. Now, he contrasts this kind of finite substance with God, where if God exists... It is definitely infinite substance, right? But the finite and the infinite for Descartes don't exist in in a kind of like uh, dialectical tension. That is, they don't oppose one another. Rather, they exist harmoniously for some reason. And he's not like he doesn't really develop this idea all too much. But what he does say is that God, because God is infinite, our idea about what is infinite is not necessary uh, because we only know what is finite. What is infinite is the kind of thing that we can never comprehend. It exists outside of the realm of what, like, is permitted by our finite nature. And he says that because of that, it has more reality. It is the more true because it exists. It kind of transcends us. And thus, he says, perception of God is prior to my perception of myself. Because I am just a part, if this is true and and God is infinite, I am only a part of that bigger infinite thing. Because if it's infinite, then it underwrites me, it encapsulates me, but I am only one little bit of that. So if God is real, God is true, uh, it then contains more objective reality in his words than any other. Now, despite this, or, you know, I cannot be sure that God does exist, right? Because as he's already laid out, we are only finite beings. So we do not have the cognitive capacity to, to transcend that, that finitude into the infinite and then therefore cannot be totally sure if God exists. But wasn't he alluding to the fact that maybe, just maybe, by him sitting alone and him working down his prejudices and doubts, down to the nub, down to the only thing that is left standing, that is, thought could that not mean that in a sense because descartes you know might be the creator of all illusions and we are all you know in our own individual ways the creator of our own collective illusions about the world it's collective and individual because we're all in this alone alone couldn't we then be said to be god we are creating this this world to which descartes says no 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 and it seems like he's worried about possible, uh, you know, charges of blasphemy by, by the church when he, when he kind of uh, halts his thought process. He says, no, because if God exists, this was already, always already um, uh, um, aware to them. God already had full knowledge of this. God didn't need, or if God exists, God doesn't need to sit in a room all alone and, you know, undo all these prejudices. They just know it. So the fact that I can strip everything down and still be left with one real thing that is thought if we do that with any operation he believes that we can essentially arrive at the ultimate cause which will be god and then he does something interesting to wrap up this meditation he says because i have an undying almost seemingly infinite willingness to undo everything i know then i am am imbued I have been conferred by God with a part of what makes God, God, that is the infinite. So God, and he draws um, an analogy. It's almost like this is the mark that a craftsman pressed 
or craftsmen, sorry, pressed upon his work. This is one of the staple things that if God exists, God is stapled onto us to almost give us the capacity to recognize God's existence, right? And we do this through this process that Descartes is laying out of, you know, doubting, arriving at the kind of possible, you know, residual uh, infinity that we can actually peek into by undoing everything. And that pushes us here into meditation four titled Concerning the True and the False. So now because Descartes has completely left his body and is just left with a thinking mind, he says that God must have been the architect to this because the mind has a natural yearning for the infinite, which we kind of concluded the last meditation with. So he's not he knows he's not being fooled because he knows that God does not deceive, right? Because if God exists and he's shown that God does exist and God is good, therefore God would not deceive us. But then Descartes says, well, how can we explain the existence of errors? If God has given us these faculties of perception, of, of understanding, of knowledge, then how can we be led astray at all? And he says, well, qu- well quite simply, we house the potential for the infinite in a finite body. And housing the potential for the infinite is just that, that the, our potential to kind of infinitely question and, and will and, and undo these, these prejudices. Because we are located in these finite bodies, in these finite spaces, we are therefore limited. And he says that we are thus in a kind of tension between the perfect God and ambivalent nothingness, like the, the illusions of the world. So we would confuse ourselves if we, you know, tried to find contradictions, like moments where humans have committed errors and say, look, like this is an example of the fact that God can't exist because if God is good, then how can we possibly explain war or famine or racism or anything like that? How could we explain that? To which Descartes says, well, then what we should be doing is not looking at these individual instances, but rather looking at the overall what he calls scheme of things, you know, God has a plan or God works in mysterious ways, essentially. And we don't have the capacity to understand God's plan, right? Because if God is truly infinite, then it would be impossible for God to birth another infinity, I guess, because if the infinite already exists, then the infinite implies that there's no room left unless it opens up into another infinity. I don't know. I, that's just me. I'm going off on a tangent. But Descartes isn't upset about this. Descartes isn't like, well, God, why did you not bestow us with the capacity for the infinite? Because Descartes is just happy that we have any conception at all, any any perceptions, any consciousness at all, even if it's just uh, finite. And so then all things are, in a sense, true, because all things are given to us by God, even if the things out in the world as illusions are illusions, but they are still there by God's grace. And therefore, our task then is to kind of locate this fundamental truth that is God. And that here pushes us in to meditation five, concerning the essence of material things, and again concerning God, that he exists. So now he's going to be more concerned with the reality of material things. But before then, it is important to consider ideas we have of those things. So he he starts with the enigma of the idea of a triangle, which I said we'd get to. I guess it was in Meditation 5 and not 6, but whatever. Uh, The idea of a triangle that doesn't exist in nature and seems only to exist abstractly, right? Because, you know, look out in nature and try to find a triangle, a perfect, you know, triangle. You would never do it. Despite this, it's immutable properties. That is, we know the things about a triangle, that it has three sides, that if we're dealing with a right angle triangle, the hypotenuse is going to be longer than... The, uh, the other two sides, that the, hy- the relationship between the hypotenuse and the other two sides are going to correspond to, you know, the Pythagoras' formula, Pythagorean formula, um, and this applies to any other shape that, you know, if you have a perfect circle, then there is an indubitable, indubitable affinity between its radius and its circumference or between its diameter and its circumference that gives us some basic uh, principles that is this relationship being characterized by pi, you know, three point one four or one whatever, a very long number. But the all of these properties about uh, geometry and just geometry generally, 
are they're real even though they don't exist out in nature they don't exist in the world so could it not just be then like our ideas about these circles and triangles and stuff could our idea about god not be as true so if the triangle exists yet it doesn't exist in nature we could almost say the same about god God exists, but we don't have any perception of God. We don't see God, but we have the abstract idea of God. What would then characterize God? So we know a few things about the triangle. Tri like I just said, three sides, you know, relationships between those sides and so on and so forth. Uh, Descartes says, well, if God exists, then we know some fundamental things. That God is good, that God is essence, that God is existence, so on and, and so forth. So therefore, God, or existence that is, uh, is inseparable from God's essence, just like a triangle's properties can't be can't leave the triangle, right? You cannot separate the triangle's properties from the triangle, lest it stop being a triangle. But this doesn't actually tell us if God exists. So he gives an example of a mountain and a valley, where he says that um, it is impossible to imagine a mountain without an accompanying valley, which is true, I guess, geographically. Um, yeah, geographically, which is true geographically, but that does not tell us that there are, in fact, mountains or valleys in the world. So while they are uh, connected, while they are linked, that is the mountain and the valley, we do not actually know, well, we do know, but that doesn't necessarily prove just by associating them, just by saying they're linked, that mountains or valleys actually exist in the world because they might not, just like triangles don't exist in the world, yet we have this idea of them. Now, despite this, Descartes holds on with, you know, we got a white knuckle grip on the fact that God must still exist because we still have this idea of it. And this existence for him would be more apparent if we didn't have all of these other prejudices or deceptions or illusions bogging us down, you know, uh, taking us away from the truth of God. So having somehow proved God, and we could, this is why I, I like Kant a lot more, <laughs> and you know. I think everyone should. But he says, having now kind of proven God's existence, he says that everything that I clearly and distinctly perceive is necessarily true. And it is now possible for me to achieve full and certain knowledge about countless things. So this kind of happens as long as things correspond to this kind of pure mathematics, you know, the giving over to the abstractions that are nevertheless true in our minds. Which pushes us here into meditation six, the final meditation titled Concerning the Existence of Material Things and the Real Distinction Between Mind and Body. So for him, he says things can be sure to exist so long as they kind of correspond to this idea about pure mathematics, as I just said. And that things appear to the imagination because it is, uh, it is an application, in his words here, an application of a knowing faculty to a body intimately present to it and which therefore exists. So we have our imagination here, and our, our imagination is what kind of conjures up these images in our mind. So when we think of a triangle, we we can all, I, I assume, if I say triangle, have an image of a triangle appear in our minds. That is kind of our mind's eye is able to conjure up this triangle. However, this kind of faculty, this, this, um, this capacity falls short if we start to consider more complex shapes, and he gives the example of a chiliagon, which has a thousand sides, or a myriagon, which has 10,000 sides. Because if you were to try to imagine either of these things in your head, because they extend far outside of the capacities of the imagination alone, they would probably end up looking the exact same in our mind's eye, because we would have a very difficult time determining an image that actually, or bringing up an image in our mind that actually had a thousand sides we we you know maybe maximum be able to do like maybe 10 i don't know whatever you'd be able to do and then everything beyond that would just kind of get muddled together right you know you wouldn't be able to discern the two with your imagination alone and here enters the intellect the intellect for him is what is the necessary faculty in your mind that fills in the blanks that the imagination doesn't present to you doesn't reveal to you so these are relating to you know abstract images right abstract ideas triangles shapes don't exist out in nature per se um, but what then do we make of the images that we get from our senses that exist in the world that we have gotten 
So they must have at least for Descartes, some of them might have some truth. They might, you know, they are created by God and therefore have some truth. But when it even like when it comes down to the body, and this is him kind of circling back to the first meditation, when it comes down to the body, we can't really be sure about the body's essence. We can only be sure about the thinking being perceiving that body because the body doesn't think. And therefore the body doesn't have this kind of like bedrock that is uh, that we can not do away with that remains nevertheless that we stripped everything else down but he doesn't want to like completely do away with the body and the reason for that is because uh, there clearly is in me a passive faculty of sensing a faculty for receiving and knowing the ideas of sensible things so mysteriously i guess i could call this mysterious we have the capacity to turn the sense data into ideas an operation that presupposes an external contributor to this faculty like God. And that is, you know, the thinking part of our existence. The thing that is able to turn what might be, you know, um, completely enigmatic, um, disconnected sense data into a kind of coherent, you know, images or, or understanding. So there must be some kind of connection between, you know, even this thinking thing and the body, even even though kind of we might want to admit that reluctantly, because he says then then there would be no reason for like humans to feel pain, right? Unless the mind and body were connected, where he gives the example, he's like, um, I, who am only a thinking being, would not sense pain when the body is injured if, you know, I was only a thinking thing, because the mind is never hurt when the body takes pain, right? When the body experiences pain, the mind goes on, right? But the mind wants to keep going because it needs the body as a vessel to keep going. So therefore, we can't just completely do away with it. So now having completely stripped everything down, Descartes is looking back and saying like, okay, well, I can't be sure about the existence of this body, but it seems as though it's pretty necessary for my, you know, being a thinking thing but again you know he doesn't want to say like let's just give ourselves over to the body now he's still very skeptical uh he's still an idealist in this way you know trying to bracket off the external world to think about the mind itself so here's a kind of longish quote up on the limitation of the senses where he says that i use the perception of the senses which are properly given by nature only for signifying signifying to the mind what things are useful or harmful as reliable rules for immediately discerning what is the essence of bodies located outside us. Let they signify nothing about that except quite obscurely and confusedly. Or yet they signify nothing about that except quite obscurely and confusedly. Sorry. So they present to us the world confusedly and obscurely, yet they present us the world nevertheless, right? So we can't discount that. And, you know, there, there's still mysterious things about it. If then the world just comes at us um, almost neutrally through our senses, then how do we explain and those senses and the world is given to us by God? How do we explain something like error? Well, to get around this problem, he gives the example of someone suffering from dropsy, which is uh, takes on another name these days. And I think it's like when your body is producing a lot of fluid, like in your uh, muscles and and you know ligaments and whatever parts of your body yet you feel incredibly thirsty because it's like almost taking the water in your body from your your throat and head and stuff and, and sending it to your body i think i think so, something like that so he says that this is a very interesting phenomenon because you find yourself exceptionally thirsty because you have a, you have a dry throat but drinking would actually kill you Drinking would actually make you want to, or would would actually worsen your condition. So he recognizes here a uh, kind of lack of concordance between what the body desires in its almost pure form. It's just telling us what it needs. Yet, if we listen to that, then we would die. So obviously, our body is incorrect. Now, the way that he gets around that. Um, is by saying that, I guess, he says that the reason this human is mistaken, that is the human that wants to drink even though that will kill them, is because the experience of dryness, that is dryness in the throat, corresponds to an overall plan. And that is a plan that lays out the concordance of a specific pain or stimulation 
with the most appropriate response, and therefore this exception is necessary to maintain integrity of the overall plan. So if I, you know, step on uh, fire with my foot, I receive a signal from my foot that goes up through my spinal cord, spinal column to my brain, or maybe it doesn't get all the way to the brain, whatever, that sends uh, a message back saying, feel pain in the foot. So I know not to do that. So when he gives the example of this person suffering from dropsy, he's saying that this is an extension of this overall plan that is to um, essentially, if, if a part of the body is ailing, like if the throat is dry, then you have the experience of dryness, which you want to try to mitigate by drinking. Descartes says that this is a perfectly good thing. We need that. Because if we didn't have this all the time, then there wouldn't be this kind of overall plan or system of the human body to ward off, uh, you know, death, essentially. And this is just an exception to make up for the entire, the overall plan. So this puts us right about to the end here. And I just want to read a couple of lines from the last page that I think round this off pretty well. So he says, Hence, I should no longer fear that those things that are daily shown me by the senses are false. On the contrary, the hyperbolic doubts of the last few days ought to be rejected as ludicrous. You know, these, this doubting he's been doing. This goes especially for the chief reason for doubting, which dealt with my fa failure to distinguish between asleep from being awake. For I now notice that there is a considerable difference between these two. Dreams are never joined by the memory with all the other actions of life, as is the case with those actions that occur when one is awake. For surely, if, while I am awake, someone were suddenly to appear to me and then immediately disappear, as occurs in dreams, so that I'd see neither where he came from nor where he went, it is not without reason that I would judge him to be a ghost or a phantom conjured up in my brain rather than a true man. But when these things happen, and I notice distinctly where they come from, where they are now, and where, when they come to me, and when I connect my perception of them with interruption, without interruption with the rest of the whole world, or the rest of my whole life, I am clearly certain that these perceptions have happened to me not while I was dreaming, but while I was awake. Nor ought I have even the least doubt regarding the truth of these things, if, having mustered all the senses, in addition to my memory and my intellect, in order to examine them, nothing is passed on to me by one of these sources that conflicts with any others. For, for from the fact that God is no deceiver, it follows that I am in no way mistaken in these matters. But because the need to get things done does not always permit us the leisure for such a, cre uh, a careful inquiry, we must confess that the life of man is apt to commit errors regarding particular things, and we must acknowledge the infirmity of our nature. Oh, okay, so to kind of briefly sum that up, we've moved back, right? We, we've now interrogated even our doubting, the thing that was supposed to bring us to the truth of, of the thinking thing, which is a part of Descartes that I think people just don't listen to. You know, they might read the first two meditations and then I don't know why they don't talk about the rest, but he's, you know, looking back on the world. He's not, he doesn't completely leave it. It seems at the end, you know, he's trying to say that we don't know, but all these things in the world might be real if they're given up to us by God, because we got, know that God is not a deceiver. But yeah, that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, if anyone, you know, made it this far and you have qualms, if you have problems, if you want to add anything, I would love to hear it. Uh, you know, if you, if you could subscribe and like and share and tell your friends and family, because everyone has tons of friends and family that want to hear about this stuff, then please do that. It would help me out a lot because uh, I want to keep doing these for as long as I can. But yeah, until next time, peace out.